Okay, so now that we know what it means for two sets to have the same size, let's start considering smaller sizes and uh, analyzing those. So the first thing to study is um, the finite sets. Okay, so there are various ways one can define finite versus infinite, and, and none of them is obvious, I would say. Um, we're going to choose this one. So we're going to say that a set is finite if it's equinumerous with a natural number. Okay, so we have a natural number. Remember, a natural number, n, is defined to be the set of all these previous elements. So the number n is itself a set that has n elements. Um, so that's why we're going to define a set to be finite. Okay, equinumerous with the natural numbers. So remember this is, I mean, intuitively, because you know the natural numbers from before, uh, it's very clear, but remember that if, you did, if you're not using what we know from before, we are starting from scratch, then a natural number is just something that belongs to all inductive sets. Um, so it's quite an abstract definition of what a natural number is, something that belongs to all inductive sets. Uh, so a set is finite if it's equimorphic to something that belongs to all inductive sets. So one has to be a bit careful to, ma to make sure that this definition, this notion of finite matches our intuition of what finite should mean, right? Because um, we are defining everything formally, not just by the intuition. Okay, so finite means equinomial with the natural numbers, and if it's not finite, we're going to say that it's infinite, okay? So infinite means there is no bijection between the set and a natural number. So one of the most basic principles about uh, natural numbers is the pigeonhole principle, um, which I guess you guys know, know it. Uh, if you have n holes and n plus 1 pigeons, you cannot put all the pigeons in different holes. Um, so mathematically it says that no natural number is equinumerous with a proper subset of itself. Okay, so you cannot find a bijection between a number which is a set of an element and, and a subset of itself. Since we are defining these natural numbers in this abstract way, uh, even if this is obvious, let's go through at least sketch a proof of how you of this. Um, what do you guys think? Well, of course, if you're talking about uh, natural numbers, induction it should be your first guess. So the proof is by induction. And if you're going to use induction, remember the way we use it is we define the set of all the things that have the property that we want, and then we need to prove that that set is inductive. So we consider a set of all ends which are not equinumerous to any proper, proper subset of itself, and we want to show that this set is everything, all the natural numbers, right? And we do it by induction, of course, and there are the two steps, oh, so zero belongs to A, well, because uh, zero is an empty set, right? And it has no proper subsets, so this is trivially true. Since it has no proper subset, every proper subset is equinumerous to whatever, or is not equinumerous to whatever else. Uh, no proper subsets. Now, suppose n belongs to A, we want to prove. So how do we prove that something is in A? We have to show that it's not. Uh, uh, there is no bijection between it and a proper subset. So let's consider a bijection. So let's, so let's suppose that we have a function f that is one to one and it's on to a set B that is a proper subset. This means a proper subset, not this is included, but not equal to n plus one. Okay, so suppose this is towards a contradiction. We're gonna reach a contradiction. Uh, let's remember, let's remind ourselves that this set n plus one is the set zero, one, all the way up to n. Okay, so we're assuming that there exists a function as a bijection between n plus one and a proper subset and we want to get a contradiction. Okay, so how is that we're going to get the contradiction? Well, um, there are a couple of cases one needs to consider. Case number one is when n does not belong to b. So remember n is the, large, the largest element in n plus 1. So in this case, uh, we, if we let uh, g be the restriction of f up to the domain uh, n, so that means we remove the element n from the domain and we left only the elements from 0 to n minus 1, we are removing um, one element from the function, then we have then g 
is one to one and onto the set B minus the the one we removed. What we removed, we removed F of N, which is itself a proper subset of N. Right? Because uh, B, we are assuming that B uh, is a proper subset of is a subset of n, right? If if uh, the number n doesn't belong to it, then we, not only we get that b is a subset of n plus one, but also it's a subset of n because the last one is not in it. But then we are removing one element, so now we get that this new set is a proper subset, and g uh, is one to one. And where is it g going to? So g goes from n to b minus f of n, which is a proper subset of n, and then, but then this contradicts that n belongs to a, because uh, we are assuming that n belongs to a, so that means there is no proper, there is no bijection between n and a subset of itself, and a proper subset of itself. Very good. Okay, so case two, case two is that n actually belongs to b, uh, so that means um, it's in the image of our function uh, b. So we're going to let a little b be such that f of b uh, equals n. Okay, so now we have that b, little b goes to n. So what we're going to do, if this little b was n plus 1, then what well, was n itself, sorry, if little b was n, and then the rest of the function will be mapping the element below n to the element below n, right? So what I'm saying is that... Uh, so if it's not, let's just make it lady. So, so let g be a new function such that uh, g uh, of a number a is going to be... Uh, if a equals b then we don't want it to map it to b, we, map, we want to map it to f of n and if a is different than b, we map it to f of a. So essentially we have n here and here is the element n, n plus 1 essentially and then this is being mapped to by f to the same thing but now it's a subset of these guys here is a subset b and then we say that b that um, there is an element b up here that's get mapped to n plus 1 and now when we define um, g, what we do is so is that we say, okay, if that's mapped there and this, where is this one map, this map maybe up here, then we change. We let all the values be the same for g, except that we map this one to that one. And then we continue with the same at f. Okay, so we only change the value of f at the point b, and we change it to be uh, f of n. Okay, so now what do we have? So now we have that g goes from n to the set b, but now we removed one of the elements um, from the image, which is um, n. So this is a subset of n itself. Alright, so we remove this guy from the image of this function. So now we have a G, and a B is uh, B was missing. It wasn't. It was a proper subset of n, and it contained n. So we want to remove it. It's still a proper subset. So this contradicts that n belongs to A. Okay, so essentially it's that we're just looking at the previous case. Um, and so we have to, uh, essentially the whole idea is we are 
transforming the fun we can see assuming there is this bijection that it shouldn't exist and then we look at we peel off the last element which there could be a couple of cases for the last element to reduce it to the previous case and assume that if we had that bijection before now we can get a bijection from the previous case from n instead of n plus one and that contradicts that n belongs to it and to do being able to peel off that, that last element we need to consider a couple of cases and maybe modify our function a tiny bit cool so there are a few corollaries for uh, this pigeonhole principle. The first one is that uh, no finite set is enumerous to a proper set, subset of itself. And why is that? Well, every finite set is enumerous to a natural number. So it's a bijection between the finite set and the natural number. So if that was true for a finite set, it would be also true for that natural number. And we know it's not. So finite sets in terms of bijections behave like the same as the natural numbers. So no finite subset is equinumerous to a proper subset of itself. And a corollary of that is that omega itself is not finite. Why is that? Um, we will say, well, omega is not bijection with, with any natural number. We know that, but why is that? Well, it's because omega is equinumerous to a proper subset of itself, right? So if you take the function f of n equals n plus 1, so this one is a bijection. between omega and omega without zero, right? Uh, it's one to one and on to, and uh, between omega and a proper subset of itself. So if you have a uh, set like omega, uh, these things exist. For a finite set, you can never have a, a bijection with a proper subset of itself. So that's, um, that's why omega is itself not finite. That's what one of the proofs. Um, and the third corollary of this is that every finite set is equinumerous to at most to a unique natural number because if it was equinumerous to two of them, then those two will be equinumerous to each other and no natural number can be equinumerous to another one because one of them is a proper subset of the other. So no two natural numbers are equinumerous. So if you're, if you're finite, you're equinumerous to, to exactly one natural number and we are called that natural number the cardinality of A. Okay, so if A is finite, when we know A is finite, we define the cardinality of A to be exactly that natural number. So we're going to do something different for infinite case uh, in the next week. Uh, no, next video. Okay, so that's a uniquely well-defined function, the cardinality of A. Um, and then there are a few other uh, limits that we can prove. So for instance, a subset of a finite set is always finite. Okay, again, you guys have intuition for this, so you know this is obviously true. But remember, this definition of finite is equinumerous with a natural number. So you have to show that if a set uh, is equinumerous with a natural number, every subset of it is also equinumerous to a natural number. So essentially, you have to show that every subset of a natural number is equinumerous to another natural number. And the proof is, again, by induction. Um, and you have to take your subset of n plus one, and then like remove the last element and see, consider what, what happens with that subset up to n, the kinomer is a natural number, and then we put the element back. So I let you guys read that one in the textbook. Try it first before reading the proof. It's a proof by induction. Um, it's a good practice for you guys. Try it first and then read the proof in the textbook. So subset of a finite set is finite. And as a corollary of that, we get, um, well, actually, this, is, this could be useful actually the other way around to prove the previous lemma that a proper subset of a natural number, uh, there is a smaller natural number that is um, uh, equinumerous to it. So that's the lemma that you need to prove the previous one. Okay, so these are like the most basic properties of uh, finite sets. As I was saying, they're all, like, you guys know all these already, these are all intuitively Intuitively obvious using your previous intuition of finite sets, but they require a little proof if you're just using this particular definition of finite, which is not that common. So I would recommend you guys go to the textbook and see um, if you can follow or do actually all the proofs before reading them. See you in the next video.